Hi, everyone. I am Madhuri Karak, the Community Engagement Lead at RES Center for Behavior and the Environment. And welcome back to our series, Rare Conversations, in which we at RARE speak with a range of experts who are really pushing the frontier of conservation as we know it by applying the latest insights from the behavioral and cognitive sciences. So today, this is our second iteration. We are chatting with Robert Frank. Robert is a professor of economics and management at Cornell University and the author of New York Times bestseller, I have it with me here, Under the Influence, Putting Peer Pressure to Work. Welcome, Robert. So excited to have you here. Uh, thanks, thanks for uh, the introduction, and I'm very happy to be doing this. Where are you today? My kitchen table. <laughs> yeah, where, where I've been for much of the last three or four months. Uh, yes, yes, feel you. Um, yeah, I'm here in my study in Washington, DC, and it's a particularly gray, humid, rainy afternoon. So yeah, this is uh, a bit of sunshine. Excited that uh, you're here. So I'm going to jump right into it. And uh, so some voices within the climate change conversation as it is you know, increasingly developing suggests that you know, focusing on individual behavior change, right? So actions like eating less meat perhaps or flying less or purchasing carbon offsets, right? So essentially, conscious consumption, lifestyle focus changes are essentially ineffective, right? Or at worst, a distraction from the efforts that are really necessary to transform the system that has gotten us to this place in the first place. So I want to begin this rare conversations with you by asking how you think the role of individual action and individual behavior change really fits into the solutions that we need to be moving towards. Yeah, thanks, Madhuri. I, I'm an economist, as you know, and, and uh, it was quite common uh, among my colleagues to take uh, the view that individual action is essentially a distraction from what we need to do. Uh, we're, we're very late taking action. As everyone knows, we have a very limited amount of time left to make a difference. And unless we have massive investment in green technology and, and stiff regulations, we won't get the kind of widespread response we need in time to make a difference. Uh, so that, that's always been the traditional view of economists and it's one that I shared. Uh, but in the, in the course of working on the book you mentioned, I've more or less changed my mind about that, not about whether we need the, the robust changes in policies that we've, we've always uh, known we need. Uh, that's still on the table, but uh, are individual actions uh, a handicap to getting where we need to go? I used to think the answer to that question was yes. I, I, I now firmly believe that it's no, uh, and that's for two different reasons. One is that I think uh, when we, we measure the effects of individual actions uh, against the, the scale of what needs to happen, they're a drop in the bu bucket, not even. They're, they're just such a trivial part of the total that whether or not any one of us did those things, uh, it wouldn't make any difference at all. That, that is still true. But what I don't think I'd seen so clearly as I see now is that when we take actions uh, individually, that's, that's not the end of the story. So thinking about uh, solar panel installation as an example, uh, the, the seminal paper by Bollinger and Gillingham showed that early in the adop adoption cycle, if we got one new installation on day one, uh, four months would pass on the average before we would see a copycat installation in that same neighborhood. They have ways of controlling to, to make sure that wasn't one that would have occurred anyway without the first one. So, so after four months, we've got two. Those two go on to spawn copycats uh, again. 
So after eight months, we've, we've got not just those two, but four and let two years pass. So we've had f four month periods stacking up. We've got 32 solar panel installations that wouldn't be there, but for the fact that that first family put one on. And, and that doesn't begin to capture the degree of behavioral contagion because each of those people will have spoken with friends and families in other locations. And, and the influence of those conversations are, much, are known to be much, much stronger than the influence of interactions among neighbors. And so really uh, the, the direct effect of your individual action is really very small. Uh, the indirect effect is many multiples, orders of magnitude often uh, larger uh, in some cases. And so I think we get much more of an effect when we take individual action, certainly than I ever realized and, and that many people did either. Uh, on top of that, and this is an even more important consideration in my mind, uh, if we take those actions, it changes who we are. And here too, I think the economists have an unrealistic impression of how the world works, many of us. Uh, we assume that people come into the world with fixed identities and preferences. Well, no, that's not how life unfolds at all. As Aristotle knew, we gradually become who we are. Uh, we, we are what we repeatedly do is, is the way uh, his work has been summarized by some. Uh, and so taking these actions uh, either makes us into a climate advocate if we weren't already one, or it makes us into a more committed one if we were one to to begin with, that in turn makes us much more likely to vote for candidates who will enact the policies that we've always realized we needed. It will make us more likely to give uh, donations to their campaigns, to go out and knock on doors, to help them get elected, to write postcards to voters and distant destinations, all those things uh, which will make policy ad adoption more likely to occur. So for, for that, pair of reasons, I think individual action is just vastly more important than I ever realized. Uh, it's not a substitute for policy change. It's, it's, a, it's a step that helps us get us to where we need to be, uh, both more quickly and with higher probability. Yes, I have to share with you and the audience. So my in-laws are from Portland, Oregon. And after reading your book, actually, I was so excited by the Project Sunroof um, satellite image that you have. I went online, I entered the address, and lo and behold, we could see, you know, which of the neighbors had installed panels. I shared it with my mother-in-law and we're actually now exploring plans um, and ideas and you know financing to get them on board so this was behavioral contagion in action for yes. me personally great example so, um i'm honestly very excited and um yeah it's it's, it's been really, really cool to see them jump on board because they saw that, in fact, their neighbors on both sides of their uh, house have solar panels. And so it's just kind of like, really? Sam and Mary? It's like, it seems so. And they didn't so, know that. They didn't, I think, because... Maybe the panels are around back. Hidden away or, you know, they have these um, hedges that uh, actually obscure um, the house, too. So Would, that's additional evidence in favor of the strength of behavioral contagion because the studies also show that if the panels are on the street side of the house where they're visible uh, by others passing by they have a much bigger influence on neighbors than if they're tucked around back where no one can see them right and project sunroof do the rescue in this case so yes. um so your book's title, right? Under the Influence, Putting Peer Pressure to Work. And it seems to me that it's really the peer part that is the key to the puzzle that we're trying to crack here, right? Because we are shaped by our peers, right? In this case, Sam and Mary, our neighbors, not strangers, but people we definitely have some feeling towards, right? It could be affinity, it could be the need to keep up with the Joneses, in this case, envy, the desire to emulate, um, but never strangers. And so 
my question then, you know, from say an implementer's point of view or from an advocate's point of view, how do we go about identifying, right, that reference network for different audiences, right? Because obviously different people would have different sets of peers slash audiences that they would be most uh, susceptible to being influenced by. And so I'm thinking whether you think social homogeneity is in fact a prerequisite for this influence to really be operating, right? Because our society, you know, it's very heterogeneous. And so is behavioral contagion something that you see would ebb and flow in the face of social differences? Or how do you see it operate in a very kind of complex social milieu? Yeah, I think uh, we are more likely to follow the example of, of people who we consider to be more like us, uh, or people, if we don't know them, people we respect or have reason to think are competent to set an example. That's all true. Uh, but it's not true that we ignore strangers. Uh, and somebody once asked me what the most vivid example I could offer of behavioral contagion was. And, and I thought and the, the, the one that stuck in my memory most strongly was a scene from an Alan Funt film. Uh, Alan Funt was the director of the Candid Camera series. He would put people in odd situations and just film what they did. He announced a good job, one that paid incredibly well, didn't have any burdensome requirements. Uh, of course, a lot of people wanted to interview for it. He invited them in. Uh, the, the subject arrives on the scene. He's ushered into a room to wait. There are already four others waiting there. Uh, we, the viewer, know that they're confederates of Alan Funt, but the new guy doesn't know that. And so they sit there waiting, and the film keeps coming back to them. They're still waiting. Finally, we see a close-up of the subject's face. Uh, he's impassive uh, at first, as always, but then he looks alarmed. The camera pulls back, and we see that the reason he's alarmed is that the other four have suddenly, at no apparent signal, stood up and have begun taking off all their clothing. Uh, he gets more and more agitated looking, but then a look of calm comes back over his face, and he too stands up and he takes off all his clothing too. And the scene ends there. They're all standing there naked, waiting for the instruction, what comes next? And when I saw that, I said to myself, no way I would have done that. Uh, but then again, I didn't need a new job. I already had a job I liked a lot. Uh, if I needed a new job and I knew that I'd gotten there last and that if anybody knew what was going on, it was the guys who had gotten there before me and they thought it was obviously worth taking the next step, what would I have done? Hard to say, but if you didn't at least have an impulse to consider following the lead of people who seem to know what they're doing, strangers or not, uh, you probably would be ill-equipped to make your way in the world. So, so yeah, we can, we can see the influence of the behavior of others across a whole spectrum of others. It's not just people we know well or look up to. Uh, and, and I think the more we can put good examples in front, front of others, the, the more effective this kind of thing can be acting on our behalf. You know, peer effects are good sometimes, as in these uh, solar insulation examples. That I think we would agree that's a socially beneficial effect. Uh, they're often bad. I think the, the common uh, valence is negative toward peer effects. We, you know, those of us who are parents always go to great lengths to try to teach our kids not to do dumb things they see their friends doing, you know? So if you're worried your kid will smoke, the, the real thing to worry about is how many of her friends smoke. You know, the higher that percentage is, the more likely she is to smoke. And if we could influence people to act as if they cared about how their own behavior affected the social environment, that would be a good thing. We could get people to encourage good examples for others or, or discourage them from, from uh, creating bad examples for, for others. And if we could do that in ways that weren't too intrusive, why not consider policies based on that insight? So in your book, one of the you know, examples that you deal with at length is the amendments to the Clean Air Act, right? And, the three decades that it almost took to put that uh, market of um, trading in sulfur dioxide permits to come into place. So are you worried then that, you know, the time frame 
right? Where we actually, in the policy realm, run with, you know, what it really means to take positive behavioral externalities into account, that we don't have the time? Or is it that we pre precisely need um, to sort of funnel those insights in because that's what is going to let us attain scale? Yeah, it, it's, it's not a question of either or. I think uh, uh, we are desperately short of time. And so uh, the, the imperative is to pull on every or within reach. And uh, I think we're at a, a, a critical juncture now at the moment. I mean, we, we, we know as, as politicians from both sides of the aisle have long said, never waste a good crisis. It's very hard to enact substantive changes in ordinary circumstances. When things have broken down seriously, when it's obvious that what we've been doing when business as usual has not been getting the job done, I think we're uniquely well positioned to consider the possibility of substantive changes. And so I think uh, the election coming up is a big one. Uh, there are gonna be people on the ballot who care about climate issues, uh, and it doesn't take much to produce big changes. Uh, I, I point uh, with, with pride to the example of Virginia last year. Last year, they flipped control of both of their uh, state legislative houses. This is not a radical hotbed state, Virginia. It, it's, it's a pretty mi middle of the road state politically, but this year, after flipping control of both houses, they enacted the most ambitious decarbonization schedule of any, any jurisdiction in the country. Uh, this can happen if we are prepared to seize the moment. So just uh, piggybacking off of what you just said, the poll results have uh, come in and Steph just shared them with me. So it seems we are in a conversation of uh, like-minded folks mostly, where 67% of our listeners, viewers, said that individual action is equally important as policy change, and then followed by 18% folks who said they're kind of important but distract us, and then 10% significantly important but will get most of us most of the way there. So. Yeah, I guess if I had to pick one of those, I would have picked the one in the middle too. Uh, if somebody said you can have either individual action or policy change and we will, I'll give you whatever policy changes you want, I'd probably pick policy changes. But, but individual action, I, I think under the circumstances is gonna get us the policy changes we need more quickly. So, you know, before we go into hearing more from our viewers and listeners and uh, taking questions. I you know, do want to kind of acknowledge uh, your insight and thank you really for this you know, argument that you conclude in your book that it's really in the doing, right? In the showing up repeatedly and building climate friendly habits that we can in fact do right by the planet and influence our peers to do the same. So I want to ask you in that vein, what is you know, really giving you hope in this time of uncertainty and just unprecedented turmoil kind of everywhere? You know, I think some of the, the cost developments in renewable en energy give the, the thickest read to lean on for, for somebody who wants to be hopeful, the, the marginal cost of operating fossil fuel plants in many areas is now higher than the cost of producing energy anew from uh, renewable facilities that have not yet been constructed. So it's, it's, it's really a ripe moment for the acceleration to occur away from fossil fuels and toward uh, uh, renewables in, in our power grid and in other ways. Uh, that there was, a, I, I think the, the climate conversation was completely stalled when we had a lot of people uh, arguing vociferously that it wasn't even a real thing, it was a hoax, that it was, it, it, well, may, maybe it was happening, but if it was happening, it was, had, had nothing to do with anything we were doing and therefore we couldn't do anything about it. 
Uh, I don't think we hear much of that anymore. There's still some, but we don't hear much. But I think my sense has been that the conversation is stalled for two reasons. One is that we, uh, a lot of people feel it's too late uh, and they feel discouraged. Why, why should we bother to act? There's nothing uh, that we can do on, t on time. Uh, and the other is, even if you think there is a, a combination of policies we could adopt that would make a difference, uh, there's pessimism about whether voters would be willing to pay the price tag for doing all of that. And uh, the thing that gave me hope on the first point was to listen to a, a, a podcast in Ezra Klein's series uh, late last year with the energy es expert Saul Griffith. Uh, he outlined the steps we would need to take uh, during the next 10 years. We need to do pretty much everything right to get there in time. But he said, if we were pre prepared to mount a mobilization like w the one we mounted in World War II, there are technologies already uh, online that will get us where we need to get to. Uh, the, the economy is going to be in a deep hole uh, next year by the time there's a vaccine for the virus and we're prepared to emerge. We'll be, we'll be needing to do an enormous amount of stimulus to get uh, people back to work. Uh, that's the ideal context uh, in which to push forward uh, massive investments in green energy. Uh, we've got to create jobs doing something. Why not take advantage of that need to, to focus on, on that imperative? So, so the, the opportunity is there in the sense that we, there are steps we could take that would do the job. As for paying for it, uh, the, the literature on the determinants of human well-being has a very important lesson there. Uh, and it's that in the West and in uh, wealthy countries everywhere, we've long since passed the point where further increases in most forms of private consumption have any measurable impact on human well-being or health or happiness uh, levels that we can measure. If the mansions were, the, were suddenly to double in size tomorrow, the people living in them wouldn't be any happier or healthier than before. Uh, in 2018, we were about $2 trillion richer than we were in 2012 uh, by GDP fi figures. There is no evidence that people were any happier in 2018 than in 2012. And what that implies is that if we had taken $2 trillion out of the spending stream in 2018, we could have spent that on green energy and people would have adapted just fine in the private consumption realm. Uh, people think it's going to hurt uh, if they're wealthy and they have to pay higher taxes because uh, every time they think about uh, times when they had less, less money, uh, they were less happy as a result of that. They got a divorce, they had a bad business year, a home fire, a, a lawsuit, something went wrong, they had less money. Those times, though, were times when they had less money and everybody else had the same as before. When we raise taxes on prosperous people, those people have less money, but everybody against whom they're bidding for the special extras that everybody wants in that group uh, have less money too. And so the same penthouse apartments with sweeping views of the city end up in exactly the same hands as before. Uh, bottom line, it would be much easier to pay for these investments than anybody realizes. Right. And, you know, for those of us who don't have the <laughs> Central Park facing penthouse problem, we can still make certain choices that, you know, don't have to be just limited in the individual realm, right? Because your sort of conceptualization of contagion shows that there are in fact cascading effects yeah. that each of our actions, be it, you know, choosing vegetarian for lunch or, you know, needling your parents to install solar panels if you know you don't have the opportunity to do so yourself can in fact have um, incredible impact so I do want to draw our listeners attention to some resources that Steph will be dropping into the chat for you to check out later I'll also make sure to link to the podcast that Robert just mentioned in our follow-up 
correspondence with you later. And obviously check out Robert's book, which is uh, out from Princeton University Press earlier this year. And of course, as always, you can learn more about Rare's work in this domain as well. But what I really want us to leave with here today is that you know there really is plenty for us to do as individuals and that as we learn from Robert, our individual actions are contagious and we can influence our peers and family and friends to adopt the actions that are necessary to keep our planet and human life viable. So I can see we have uh, already a bunch of questions that are coming in. So Robert, should we do it? I'm set to go. Let's, let's, let's uh, check out the first question and I'm going to be taking them in the order that we received them. So, okay. The first question we have here is, are you familiar with the work done at Stanford on dynamic norms? And do you think the mere perception that is through media exposure that others are changing and taking stronger pro-environmental actions? So the example you know, of switching to plant-based diets, for example, can significantly impact others to undertake similar actions on climate change. Why, why not? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think it's a good opportunity to point out the, the way in which policy and uh, informal norm spreading interact in a constructive way. So I think most people uh, who eat meat heavy diets in this country anyway, the ones I know uh, are vaguely aware that it would probably be good for them individually in terms of their health if they ate less meat, but also good for the planet. Uh, why don't they just do that? Uh, the, the main reason seems to be that uh, they and their friends eat meat heavy diets and it's just the custom in their circle to do that. They were raised that way and that's what their friends do. Maybe they're worried their friends will think they're cheapskates if they serve them a meat light diet uh, uh, on, on uh, gathering occasions. Uh, and so if, if we were to imagine the effects of a carbon tax, uh, people are quick to criticize carbon taxes saying they won't get uh, the, the emissions down anywhere near soon enough to be a solution. Uh, that's true. If we'd adopted one decades ago, it would have been all we would have needed to do. But now it is too late. But that's not a reason not to adopt one. And if we adopted a revenue neutral carbon tax, that means you take all the money that people pay in, you give it back in rebates every month. Uh, the, the, the wealthy use much more energy than everyone else. They eat more meat. They, they emit more carbon in, in every aspect of life. They, they would pay in the lion's share of the revenue from a carbon tax we could refund that revenue in a progressive fashion so that as many as 90% of all families would get a rebate check each month that was more than they paid in carbon taxes. And so they would have an incentive to shift away from carbon heavy footprint uh, items uh, in favor of ones with lighter footprints because they're cheaper, relatively speaking. And they wouldn't be denied any options because their, their budgets would be even uh, uh, greater than before because of the rebates. Uh, and so there's no reason whatsoever for those people to object to that change in policy. 90% of the people would be unambiguously better off. Uh, if you could get that policy passed, uh, most people would continue eating the way they did in the past, but a few would change. We know the response to price incentives is weak and slow, but a few would change. And as they changed, uh, their impact on others would magnify the, the influence of their changes. They, those others would change slowly too. And we would see a snowballing of positive feedback effects. And, and within a fairly short order, we might expect the whole dietary customs of the society to have changed in a quite palpable way. So I think that's the kind of organic change that's, that has a, a greater likelihood of succeeding than than just telling people that you ought to eat less meat uh, or, or, or trying to exhort them to be vegans. Most people don't want to be ve vegans, but they, they're, they're more than content to imagine sliding onto a path where everybody's behavior changes in a constructive way. 
Right. And just, I think, knowing that the status quo is shifting around you sort of creates a momentum that makes making changes that much more easier, right? The initial yes. inertia is uh, lessened. I have another question that I think you will have a lot to say about. So the question is, do you think policy changes work best as rules and laws that folks can comply with or defy, or when they're integrated as choice architecture? So for those folks new to behavioral science, uh, jargon choice architecture essentially minute changes in our environment. So we don't you know, necessarily even know that those changes have been made to bypass fear and politics. So rules and regulations, laws, or choice architecture, implicit nudges that we don't even know exist. I, I think if you can avoid kindling the kind of uh, you're not the boss of me response that we see often when we try to compel people to do things, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing to keep in mind as an objective of your, of your approach. The, the background I've, I've had in my decades as an economist makes me more sympathetic than many people are to tax approaches to uh, policy change. If we, if we ask what's the reason there are too many CO2 emissions, it's because it's costly to filter them out and we let people dump them into the air for free. Uh, if we charge them for dumping them into the air, which is essentially what we would be doing with a carbon tax, then people would suddenly get all, all manner of creative in figuring out ways to reduce them at the, at the least possible cost. And I think the most vivid example of that that I've seen has been the response to cigarette taxes. Uh, we adopted them in earnest in the 1980s. Uh, and what we know is that people don't respond much to changes in prices, uh, especially for things that they're habituated to. I had a friend who had been a heroin addict. He told me it was much, much harder to quit smoking than it had been for him to quit uh, consuming heroin. Uh, it's a very addictive substance, substance, nicotine is. But we know when the price of cigarettes went up substantially, most people didn't quit, but a few did. A few others who would have started didn't start. That meant that every peer group of those people had fewer smokers in it. And so fewer people in those peer groups started smoking or more of them quit. And it just snowballed from that, that point outward. And so, whereas uh, for, for men who in America once smoked at a greater than 50% rate, now the rate is 13%. You don't see a response like that just from uh, uh, people seeing higher prices. Uh, you see that uh, you can't explain it as big a drop as we've seen, except by the influence of peers on, on, on their behavior. So I, I think uh, the, the more we can avoid telling people uh, what to do in a clumsy way, and the more we can give them incentives to behave differently, uh, the better all else equal. Sometimes you just have a behavior is so harmful that you just have to say you're not allowed to do that. We don't tax people for, for yelling fire in a crowded theater. We say you're not allowed to do that. So Robert, we're getting a lot of questions on individuals, political participation and speaking to just folks who feel differently about the climate. So this question, says, do you think policy changes work best as, no, we already did this. This is the political polarization one. Well, this is basically about, you know, whether we should expend energy talking to opponents, so climate deniers. The, the last chapter in my book tries to tackle that, that question, how do you talk to people who are on the other side of the fence? And, and it's, of course, very difficult to do that. And trying to prove to somebody that she's wrong about something is a, is a singularly ineffective strategy for, for, for trying to solve that problem. Uh, the, 
the people who have studied communication uh, have some pretty interesting findings. The, the clearest and most useful one in my reading of that literature is that it's always better not to try to explain something to somebody unless you've been directly asked to do that. Uh, instead, listen attentively, try to, try to uh, uh, indicate interest in what, what your conversation partner is saying. And the main uh, lever you have to get people to, to think in a fresh way is to ask the right question at the right moment. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a simple example from my own experience in talking with opponents of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, they liked some features of the act. They liked the, the requirement that you cover people with pre-existing conditions. Yeah, that was a good thing. But uh, almost to a person, they hated the mandate. Oh, the government doesn't have the right to make me buy health insurance if I don't want to. And so the, the question I stumbled onto uh, uh, in, in one of those conversations was just to ask people, what do you think would happen if the government required fire insurance companies to sell fire insurance to homeowners at reasonable rates after their homes had already burned down? And you don't have to think long about that question. Uh, every, everybody quickly saw that, well, if the government made, made them do that, then the companies would go bankrupt in short order because nobody would buy insurance until his house had already burned down. Why would you buy it if you didn't think you needed it? Uh, and once you've, once you've made that connection, then it's just the smallest possible step to see that the patient with pre-existing conditions is the guy whose house has already burned down. There's no way private insurance companies can insure that person unless everybody's in the pool. Uh, and so suddenly, opposition to the mandate uh, maybe didn't dissolve 100% in every case, but people seemed willing to rethink why they were so opposed to it. So you gotta look for the right question to ask, and that just depends on the dynamics of the conversation that you're in. But don't give up. Uh, uh, I mean, some people aren't willing to talk to you in good faith. Don't waste your time with them, but, but uh, more people are willing to engage than, than we might think. Yes, I think that answers a lot of questions we are getting around, you know, should we post about perhaps not so visible, positive environmental actions that we are undertaking in private? Um, who should we speak to? To what extent should we push the envelope? And I do have to say Robert's chapter in the book titled Ask, Don't Tell is a great primer on climate communication strategy if uh, any of our listeners are interested in delving into that more. And when it comes to uh, putting your virtuous behavior on display, that can be counterproductive too. Uh, I, I don't know what the net effect is, uh, but some, many people at least complain about virtue signaling. Oh, somebody's just trying to posture or so, show off. Much more uh, effective, unambiguously effective, is if you see someone doing something that has good environmental con consequences, point that out to people. So-and-so installed solar panels. Uh, uh, what, what a good thing uh, to see that happening in our neighborhood. Okay, I have so many questions. Uh, I'm delighted our audience is so engaged. The next one we have is, Many sustainable solutions tend to be more expensive and time incentive intensive, which makes them not as accessible for citizens without a higher level of income privilege, what have you. Do you think there is a need to push for more equity in the climate change movement? Yeah, one of the points that uh, Saul Griffith makes in his conversation with Ezra Klein is that uh, it, it, it's not going to get us where we need to be if only the people who can afford green technology are the ones who uh, adopt it. It's got to be everybody with solar panels and radiant heating and, and electric vehicles. And so uh, his, his solution is to make low-cost financing available. He talks about the GI Bill and how, how so many people got to buy homes and, and go to college who wouldn't have been able to afford to do that. Uh, 
that just pushes back the question uh, one step, how do we pay for that? And so the, the, the issue is how, how do we raise the money to, to make uh, these things affordable to people who don't have much income? And, and the only place to go is to tax the people who have gotten the biggest income gains over the last four or five decades, which are people at the top. Uh, they have resisted tax increases. Uh, there's a, a chapter in the book uh, I call the mother of all cognitive illusions, uh, talking about why they've resisted tax increases. Uh, uh, that, and, and my claim in that chapter is that they resist them because they overestimate how painful they'll be. Uh, they won't, in fact, be painful at all. Uh, these people have everything they might reasonably be said to need. Uh, I, I think they would acknowledge that quickly. Uh, all that is at issue is their ability to buy special extras in life. Those are almost always things that are in short supply and you get them by bidding against other people like you who also want them. And when you and they pay higher taxes, your relative bidding power is exactly the same as before. So we can afford to make these things essentially uh, free or low cost for the people who don't have money to install them on their own. And it's in our interest to do that. We, we, we can't tax them to do it. We've got to tax ourselves to do it. I have another one. When it comes to individual actions, do you see a benefit of a more moderate approach, right? So something you were alluding to earlier, right? So instead of saying we all now need to be vegetarian or vegan, what would a strategy where you communicated as eat less meat versus you know the more explicit more draconian we have to be vegetarian how do you think i i heard cory booker asked that question uh as you know he's a vegan and the interviewer asked him uh why do you senator advise people to eat a little less meat, why don't you instead advise them to become a, a vegan as you have done? And he didn't miss a beat. He answered that if I urged people to become vegan, uh, hardly anybody would heed that advice. I might uh, cause meat consumption to go down by one one hundredth of one percent. If I pointed out and reminded people uh, the reasons for consuming a little less meat, maybe he could uh, cause there to be a three or four or five percent reduction in total meat con consumption. So orders of magnitude more effective to take the, the gentle step than to, the, than to advocate the radical step. Uh, in the case of decarbonizing the electric grid, we need to take radical steps. So I, if there's a choice between slow and fast there, I'd say that's, that's an easy call. You go fast as, as you possibly can. But in these behavioral uh, shifts, often it's the, it's, the, it's the gentler push toward change that ends up being more effective even in, in, in the long run. Robert, I really like this question. So several years ago, there were a bunch of these peer pressure apps floating around, right? Where you post things like, I rode my bike to the party, I brought my own reusable silverware, and the person who's asking the question writes, none of them took off, right? So what do you have to say about their failure? Why did they fail? And do you think such apps are even a good idea in the first place? Uh, the failure is of the apps, the, what, what people didn't buy them, people, people didn't use them, they was just, the failure? I assume didn't attain much traction. Yeah, it's a it's a crowded marketplace out there. We've got, uh, you know, people are spending a lot of time on Twitter and Facebook and with electronic games to get somebody to 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 use what might seem to them like a hair shirt app. That's a that's a hard sell. Uh, and, and that's partly why I feel so uh, uh, strongly about the logic of adopting a carbon tax. Uh, if, if you adopt that, that one me measure and make it revenue neutral, most of the population ends up with more money every month. Most of the population ends up with strong incentives to change their behavior. Uh, 
and we see multiplier effects from peer uh, influence at every turn. The, the people who are net payers under a carbon tax, those would be only the very wealthy. Uh, they get the lion's share of the benefits from climate cleanup. They have much more at stake in the, in the losses that climate change imposes on us. And they're going to bear the lion's share of the tax liabilities for climate mitigation measures going forward. So, so they come out ahead on balance too. There's just not a single cogent argument, uh, argument against adopting a carbon tax. It's not the only thing we need to do, obviously, but uh, I think it's just a, a, a failure of political leadership of the highest order that that hasn't been ex explained clearly to voters. I can't imagine voters opposing that measure if they really understood what the choice was. So this is an interesting kind of technical question. So the viewer writes, there's a lot of work around promoting collective action for environmental issues. So what do you think is the tipping point between individual action and collective action when we're taking into account peer pressure? The, the argument I've tried to lay out is that individual action has much more leverage than most of us realize because it produces not only the direct effect of our action, but it also causes others to change their behavior too. Uh, often uh, in, in numbers that are truly prodigious, not just small changes. But the, but the other feature of individual action is that it changes who you are. And in the process, it makes you much more uh, willing to take active steps to try to bring about the election of people who will enact the policies that we really do need to adapt, enact in order to make rapid progress on this front. So there's, there's really not a, a there's not a conflict about what to do that I see. I mean, I think we go as fast as we can on the policy front uh, and take uh, every available action on the individual front, secure in the knowledge that those second steps are going to make it easier for us to achieve progress on the first front. I think the question we also have, you know, does social media play a role in peer influence when it comes to creating positive behavior change? And I think you partly answer that. Yeah, yeah. It's an amplifier. So you, you, you can post a picture of yourself driving your hybrid car, but better still post a picture of your, your niece driving one or your neighbor driving one. Exactly. Uh, I do want to thank all of you for joining us. Thank Robert for taking all these questions and sharing your just thoughts on the book, what's out there in the world and really the urgent work that needs to be done. So if you haven't already, do check out Robert Frank's book, Under the Influence, Putting Pre Peer Pressure to Work from Princeton University Press and then go on and learn more about Rare's work to inspire individual action on climate change at rare.org slash make it personal. Thanks so much and have a great day.